I'm uh, working for a company called F-Secure. And we're, gonna, we're a bunch of colleagues who are doing penetration testing. We have an office in Stockholm. And uh, this was a finding that we did during an assignment for a customer. And uh, we were investigating how that customer could protect themselves using an F5 load balancer. And F5 is using something called iRules, and I'll explain much more about that during this talk. Um, this is the first of a series of talks. It's the premiere for this vulnerability. And uh, uh, I'm presenting it here because I like the local Swedish audience. And the next talk I'm going to present at, or the next conference I'm going to, is Black Hat uh, in Las Vegas, where I'm showing uh, uh, how to further this vulnerability and gain further access. Um, I want to give thanks to my colleagues over at F-Secure, and uh, definitely a big thanks to F5Cert, who have been really helpful in confirming the vulnerability. And they, as of yesterday, presented a advisory to their customers on how to reach out and get help if they think that they are vulnerable to, to this issue. All right. I made my first uh, TCL open source project um, back in 2002, and it's on SourceForge still, and it contains plenty of these vulnerabilities. Why did I say TCL, or it's called Tickle sometimes? It's because there's a relationship between Tickle and the language iRule that I'm going to present vulnerabilities in today. And uh, it's a language that otherwise this might be considered dead, but I think it's interesting to investigate the, the risks of, of still using uh, older languages and uh, and their tiny quirks. So the product we're talking about here, it's a load balancer. And it's a part of the F5 product series. F5 is the name of the company. And the product name is Big IP, I think, or the Big IP series. And so this product can uh, help your company protect, uh, protect it from denial of service attacks. But it can also store and handle cookies for you. So imagine uh, you have a bunch of backend servers in your company, in your organization. And these ha doesn't have synchronized state between them, but uh, somehow your traffic coming into that company, it could be SIP, but mostly it's, uh, it's HTTP, uh, can be handled by this product. And to configure all this, you're using a language called iRules. And uh, what's neat about the product is that it's uh, pretty resilient to heavy traffic, which means that it can handle terabytes of traffic. So it's a pretty dedicated product that comes in hardware and in a virtual appliance. And it's um, used in very large corporations. I'll show something about that later. It also has a web application firewall and other features that you might want in this type of product. So iRules. iRules are used to configure rules of how to handle traffic. Imagine you want to have some other traffic coming into your organization going one way and other traffic going in another way. And iRules is a fork of TCL 8.4, and TCL, TCL or Tickle 8.4 was superseded by version 8.5 in 2007. And that means that the features you're seeing in iRules today are the features you saw in Tickle in 2005 or 6. Those are the features that are still there. And uh, since then, the language hasn't evolved much, but there are some minor security things and some technical things that, that has evolved in Tickle that hasn't evolved in iRules. And I want to point out that this vulnerability is not necessarily based on problems in the product uh, products from F5. It's more in how you use that product. But you'll see more about that later, how, how you can actually make mistakes when you're configuring them uh, that, that can cause you a lot of trouble. And uh, I'll, I'll start by showing how the language uh, is set up and used. So in this case, I'm using a, a, a clause called when. And when is catching an event. And the event is HTTP request. So we're having an HTTP re request coming into our device. And uh, right now, we have a rule that says that use HTTP redirect to redirect that request to this HTML page. And uh, the HTTP request is, is handled and parsed by the, the, the engine of the, the F5 or the Big IP device. And the rules are matched against that parsing. 
there is a website called Dev Central, where it's like a, a stack exchange for for uh, iRule code, and a lot of users have supplied their own code there, and in a lot of those cases, those uh, that code might be vulnerable. So to find such advice, so now you know something about what this language is and where it applies. And um, to find uh, these devices in the wild, uh, you're probably looking for a server header like this one, where it says server colon big IP. And this is something that you won't see on every request. So if you catch or try to catch the index.html page of a given website, it's not going to give you this server header. Um, Uh, instead, uh, it's going to give you the normal server header of that uh, uh, of that web server. But if you if you request a page that is being redirected or a page that's being stored in the F5 device, it's going to provide this server header from uh, directly from the device, uh, which in this case is is Big IP. So if you catch a file over HTTP like the fav icon .ico, it's most likely to have this header if it's an F5 device. And we did this to collect some stats. And uh, this is uh, by no means a, a full list of the devices uh, that there are, but we made something like a showdown search, and we found loads and loads of devices that are using it. And it's a very, very, very popular device, and it's extremely popular in large corporations. So the large big brands are using this device, and the large big brands network teams are the ones who are configuring it. And what we're de dealing with here is a product that actually needs a programmer to, to program it, while the responsibility of programming it always ends up on the networking team because it's something that's edgewise. It's something that goes to the, to the edge of the network. And it's usually someone with a, a Cisco degree or a certification uh, type of education that goes into programming uh, these in the big brand companies. All right. So you all heard the or you've all seen the, the Simpsons episodes when when Bart is calling Moe's bar and he's asking for Al and and Kaholic and the last name and 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 when when um, eventually Mo resolves this and realizes that he's asking for alcoholic or alcoholics then 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 he gets really really mad and this is something what uh, what this product or this problem is about or all these types of problems are about this is a type of vulnerability where there is a a misconception or misunderstanding of the context of the information before it's presented in its completeness. Right? And in Tickle, there are a few ways of parsing uh, strings or parsing information. They usually say that in Tickle, everything is a string. But there are more ways of, of defining them. And here's something called the, the argument interpretation, the argument expansion of a command. A command is the first thing that starts a line, like if, when, uh, or while, or something. That's a command. After that, you have the argument list. And the first one is a quoted argument. And now here's the English lesson for your, all your Scandinavians. If you haven't started using the term bracket, that's the, the hard brackets. There's also braces, that's the curly braces. And there is the unquoted arguments. And these three have completely different meaning. So what you would see on the first line, a lot of people would expect that to be the definition of a string. A string is inside of quotes. Well, that's not entirely true here, because something that's going on inside of a quote here is something that could be a command execution. What's going on inside of the bracket, the second line, that's something that's going to be executed. In this case, that's a, almost an incorrect way of writing, but it means that argument one, whatever is in that variable, is executed as a function or as a command itself. Line three, that's where we're looking at someone who is trying to make a string. Curly brackets, that's how you make a string in Tickle. And line four, that's uh, separate argument listings, and that's also used for, for execution. So one, two, and four are used for execution uh, of things, while three is a string. All right. And my presentation thing here got disconnected, so I have to turn around for a bit. So inside of the 
double quote, anything going on inside of the double quote, this is the most common mistake that I see every time we audit the F5 device, is that the iRule contains a quote, and that quote contains some vi variables that's being substituted or someone's working with those quotes. And the moment you have a variable inside of double quotes, the content of that variable can be executed if that contains executable code. And if that, uh, when I'm saying executable code, that means a line that starts with a bracket, the hard ones. If the line starts with a bracket, that means that some, something that I'm doing is executing. It's the same as the backtick in Bash. You have all seen the, the backticks that you're doing for command ex execution in Bash. And that's, that's about the same thing. And I need to explain this syntax because not a lot of people know the language from before. And it, it would make things easier for everyone. So there was a prior art in this. There has been documentation on the Tickle wiki. And this wiki page explains, this is an article that's been updated since 95. But this is the only source that I've found that actually explains this issue. And it doesn't have very many reads, and, and a lot of people don't know about it. Uh, and I can't advertise it enough, because I think it's pretty good. So the line where it says catch puts variable, that line is incredibly vulnerable. That line is trying to execute the content of variable if there is something executable. So if I'm using the command error pwned in there, if I'm putting that into variable catch, which is the try accept uh, thing, it will actually, actually execute that code. And another case where the same thing is happening is when I'm not using quotes or unquoted substitutions. And this occurs if I'm using after, which is like sleep, after one second, execute body, uh, or while one, which is true in this case, execute body, or if one, which is true, execute body, switch one, matches to one, you get the point. Uh, this list of commands that has this quality is pretty long. This is a list of the functions that you should be careful about using inside of an iRule, because they might cause <laughs> code execution. And a lot of people don't know this, and a lot of people are executing, or could be executing code. The thing is, your program will work even though you're not executing code. It will work uh, regardless, but, uh, an, uh, but an attacker could also execute things. And here's the worst uh, perpetrators. Substitute, eval, and expert. You all know, or a lot of people of you know, that eval can cause command execution. Uh, that means that eval evaluates the command that it's running. And uh, I still see a lot of tickle code out there, or a lot of iRule code that's using eval. And that's why I'm going to use that as an example later. Substitution means a string substitution, where it's doing something to a string. And uh, doing that means you have to resolve the content of the string that you're handling. And in a lot of cases, that means executing whatever code is in there, or whatever function is in there. Expressions. Expressions are the mathematical foundation of programming, and that's one plus one. Expressions are also uh, evaluating commands. So if I have an expression with a sub-expression like uh, one plus one, uh, or one plus one times nine, then there is a predecessor towards the multiplication, and then there is the addition, right? And that sort of math is something that actually can or will end up as an execution. Uh, and uh, that means that you be, have to be extra careful using any of these. And you have to know what functions you're running that are running any of these. Like an if statement, it also runs expressions. Or sorry, it also runs yeah, the expressionist way of, ex um, of evaluating uh, the mathematical expression. Another issue that I like to mention that I think is less crazy, but it's important to be aware of. And the reason why I think this is important to be aware of is that um, this has to do with how this, this, all the things or strings are interpreted, uh, interpreted. So if you make a switch statement, switch is like case. So you make a case statement, and you have a few cases like these. If I'm checking that x is 1, or 2, or default, switch can also have an option. Right now, if you look at this, how the syntax of switch works, it says switch, options, string, pattern. If x happens to look like an option. If it says dash in the beginning, then that means that this is an option. So if I put dash garbage, 
then I will get a syntax error saying switch does not have an argument called garbage. And that means that you can break the syntax of an input when it's trying to match your switch statement. So let's say that your iRule code is interpreting something that's a user inputted, like a get string, it's uh, or it's uh, taking your user agent, and it's making a, catch, uh, a switch statement on that user agent. If your user agent contains a dash first, and then garbage or crash, then that switch statement will fail. And that means that I, can, uh, that I can control the flow somewhat of an application. But it also means that I can go outside of the boundary of what I'm trying to check by adding additional code. And I'm going to use that in, a, um, in an exploit code later. Uh, yeah, you can also actually use real arguments and add and remove arguments or add arguments to your switch statements if you want to. If you want to turn it into a, a glob state when, statement where it's matching star as anything, for instance. So exploitation. What do we want to do as attackers? We want to first identify is this code vulnerable? That's what you want to do if you're a pen tester. That is what you want to do if you're a state actor or whatever. Right? So that means that you're going to try to inject uh, a tickle script or an iRule script into a variable of some kind in a HTTP request. And you're going to see if that was evaluated or someone actually ran it for you. And then you need to look for those ident uh, identifiers. Did it actually run? And then you can, uh, after that, try to identify where in the code did this happen. And once you've done that, uh, you can identify are there any external resources in that code that I can use to pivot my access and gain more um, privilege uh, for this execution. And I'm going to show you a demo of what it actually looks like when you are uh, exploiting this. And on top, you're seeing a web browser. Uh, and it's visiting a page called index.asp. And in the bottom, you're seeing the tool burp that we use a lot when we pen test. I think all of you use it, probably. And come on. Just move. OK. So I'd like it to play, yeah. So when I make a request in Burp, uh, the, the proxy tool will actually show the request that I just made. And if you look at the fields that you could potentially be exploiting, it could be something like user agent. It could be the get part. It could be the HTTP version. All of these are things that iRules can interpret and understand. So it could be something that could end up in a variable that I can exploit, right? So the accept statement could be uh, something. If it's an upgradable request, uh, the host name definitely is something that's interesting. In my case, I am looking for something that's more tangible, like a cookie. Uh, and right, I wrote this code, so I happen to know what's vulnerable. If I look at the response from the server, I see that the server is setting a cookie called logged out. Interesting. So since it's setting a cookie, maybe that's the cookie that I'm going to try to change and start with changing. So I'm going to send that to the repeater in Burp. And in the repeater, I'm going to select the cookie and uh, erase the value. And in there, I'm going to put some iRule code. And iRule code first, the hard bracket. Hard bracket means execution, all right? I type tcp colon colon respond, which is a command. And that command has an argument inside of curly brackets. Sorry, <laughs> curly braces. <laughs> and when I execute that, you see in the beginning of the line, it says hello there. So this means that the server executed that tcp respond, and it replied with hello prior to the HTTP message coming. And I can see that, OK, there's something going on there I can execute in this context. Uh, there is another command that I'm trying to go with that's HTTP respond, and I'm using the wrong syntax. And the server responds pretty quickly, and it's just failing. Uh, this will probably go into the logs. So try avoid making bad syntax or making syntax errors, because syntax errors are logged. While if I'm making a successful attempt, I'm not being logged at all. And there is a command called info 
level zero, and info level zero gives you the source code of the actual program that I'm running at. And it's pretty neat. <laughs> And that's when I can start identify. okay, ah, that's the vulnerable part. That's the bad thing, because it's doing a substitution with that string, and yeah, apparently you can't do that. So, Because you remember the three really, really bad guys there, so don't do that. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for the initial step into uh, hacking that system. And that means that I now have code execution in that context. Right, so I, I understand there's a lot to take in because now we're learning both a new language and new exploitation technique at once, but maybe you can go back and watch the video again or something if you need to. I'm gonna move on. There's something called a session table, and a, or a, a session table is a table with a key value store where you can store things that you otherwise, um, that, 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 that can be persistent between sessions. Like sometimes you want to store a cookie there. Uh, a lot of people are storing caching things there like uh, to prevent denial of service or prevent someone from executing a thing a million times. They're using uh, this session table. The problem with anything that's being persistent in this context is something that's also going to be shared between the sessions. So even though I'm logged out uh, and someone else logs in, they're gonna be pulling information from the same session table or the same table. And the same goes for anything else that's persistent. Before I move on, I'd like to point out that having this access that we have now, we can access any network device internally inside of the network because this is a networking device. It can connect any TCP connection that I would possibly want to. So I can scan the local network, uh, and maybe there I can find persistence. Maybe there I can find something that I can execute, something that uh, would be interesting for me to get a, a, a more permanent access. Right now, we're only acting in RAM, and that's why we're not being logged, right? Uh, but if we can get some kind of persistence, preferably persistence in RAM, then we're still not logged, but we can maintain ourselves over the sessions. And this is where I think tables are interesting. Uh, all right, so, and also, uh, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but these devices are, are redundant, or you can run them in a redundancy mode. So you have multiple uh, devices that are synchronized magically. In this case, it's pretty amazing how well this session table is, is uh, synchronized between the devices. And that means I can also pivot access between the devices. So regardless of which uh, of the devices my target is connecting through, I can still maybe hack them through a table. So a table can, where is something where you can set a value in a, what's called a subtable. You can make a lookup of the keys of the table, and that means that you can look up the key values. You can make add and you can make replace. So you can add new values and replace. All right? And that means that you can overwrite uh, the values of a session table. So if someone has a cookie, you can overwrite that cookie with a value that X actually execute things. Or you can make XSS if that's what you want, but uh, this is, I think, more serious. Oh, and, and a consequence of that, naturally, is that these devices, they come after the TLS termination, and that means that you can actually uh, intercept the traffic uh, even though it has TLS in, in the communication, and you get a, a completely uh, clear, transparent uh, information there. I'm going to see if I can load this video. So in this case, it's going to be a more complex case, but I think it's interesting to, to watch. This is a DNS resolver. And this DNS resolver, you're typing in a host name. And uh, instead of the host name that used to be localhost, I'm just going straight off and just starting to hit it with attacks. Uh, in this case, I forgot to put braces around test, but it doesn't matter because Apparently, you can also do unquoted strings. And the, the requests are taking long because it's trying to make DNS, a DNS lookup uh, of this prior to, uh, prior to executing it. And maybe it gives me a chance to breathe. So right now, we can see that it's vulnerable again because we put test in there. It also responds with a big IP server name, by the way. And 
the first thing we do is info level zero because we want to see the source of the thing. There's plenty of other info commands that gives you really, really interesting stuff. Uh, you can look at the manual yourself if you're interested. You can list the commands, you can list the variables in the context, the patch level of the service, etc. And I think it's important to start looking at uh, the source code early so that you know what you're looking for. I also, I forgot to put the, a bracket there. I think that's why I, it, it responded quickly and failed me. Yeah, so there we go. Syntax errors, really, really bad. So anything logged in this device, the logging is something that you have to facilitate yourself. You have to write the log command to make things to log. And that's why, but if you make a syntax error, that's going to be logged anyway, because it's an error. Uh, so here's the source code, and it's a bit more of a complex case, and we're going to look at the source code later uh, more in detail. But we can see that there's two evals. I've highlighted those. Eval is bad, eval evil. And uh, there is almost never a valid reason to use eval at all, and it's always dangerous. Um, one of them is in the cache part, so if some, a DNS lookup is cached in the session table, then that means that it will run uh, in the first case. In the second case, uh, it's for every new request, uh, eval is going to be made. This line that we're looking at, looking at right here is taken from an open source snippet, uh, the, the previous one, it's taken from an open source snippet, this one is taken from an open source snippet of a tool that's the most downloaded script on the Dev Central website, by the way. And uh, that means that this is vulnerable in the, vile, in the wild in a lot of places. And I chose not to show that entire script because um, I thought this would be more responsible, maybe. <laughs> So in this case, I'm going to make an exploit that's not using brackets, but I've realized that since I could do dash crash to switch, maybe I can continue this statement with a semicolon. So I'm typing localhost, which is the domain name, semicolon, and now I'm making an insert inside of the table, and there I'm putting the string tcp colon colon respond, owned, yeah, sure, whatever. And that's just a string that's been going to be put there that eval then will evaluate the next time a user starts to look up a host like the local host. So that's the, that's the entire idea behind that uh, line of reasoning. And uh, right now, I, I didn't put any output, so there's no information for me that this worked or not. I forgot to make a TCP respond to myself. And that's fine. Also, URL encoding is important in a GET, so that's something I forgot to. And now, probably it worked. And again, if you didn't URL encode, you'll have a syntax error, which is not good. And since this is executed right now, it's saved this into the database, the TCP respond owned. And if I'm now making a lookup for localhost, now that's being run. Next time anyone requests localhost on this service, the code will execute and they will look like they're owned. This might as well be code that intercept the traffic, steal their cookies, do anything on any other user session. And this means that we can elevate our access. The moment people start using any type of persistence between sessions, we can elevate that and actually go into other user sessions and intercept their traffic, steal their sessions, uh, or any credentials they have. I think it's amazing. <laughs> so I just take it. Oh, sh I don't know where I'm. OK, so this is what the, what the code looked like. And to a layman, if you're a network engineer and you're being presented with this code that you're inheriting from someone else and you're supposed to determine why this was bad, I was searching uh, Stack Exchange, actually, for, for people in the TCL uh, subgroup if there was anyone who could explain why eval was bad. And there was nobody who could explain why it was bad. It was like the, the most severe recommendation was someone saying that evil is bad somehow. I remember it was bad. I can't explain why. And, and 
why it's bad, I'm going to explain it to you, is because it executes whatever is coming into it. And, and that's, why, that's why this line is bad, uh, and that's why this line is bad, even though I, as a user, I have control of the variable called host. It's inside of quotes that's being handled by the, the variable resolve lookup. But even though it is, I'm still inside of the evaluation statement. And, and this particular line you keep seeing over and over again in different scripts. And, and also uh, the unquoted version like this one, where it's being executed inside of another context. And uh, I think it's, it's irresponsible not to bring it up. And since the documentation doesn't really show anything, then I think it's, it's, it, it, there is a point in, in, in starting to investigate it. And if you're a pen tester and if you're doing an F5 device pen test, you need to ask for the source code. You need to actually make a code review and you need to look for these things. And if you think that's complex, which it is, Try to read up uh, on, on these slides, but also try to use this tool. I, I put it on GitHub, and it's called TCL Scan, and it's a, a tool that someone else made five years ago and abandoned it, and he fell off the earth, the guy who did it, and I couldn't find him again. And the tool was pretty broken, but I spent some time fixing it. And after fixing it, it's uh, written in Rust. What it does is it scans code lines like these for uh, keyword keywords that are dangerous on the same line. So it's, it has a list of all the, the, the bad keywords. It has a list of the bad behaviors, unquoted variables and quoted variables. And once it finds that, it puts a danger or warning. And in this case, it would put a danger. In this case, it would put a warning because this is maybe bad. Actually, it's definitely bad, but it doesn't know that. And in a lot of cases, the vulnerable code will be identified using TCL scan. And that's something that you can build into your Git hook. So the next time someone makes a Git commit of iRule code, you can get a warning saying that the code you just committed is dangerous. And that's something you have to enforce on your organization so that they actually find the bugs themselves because you cannot be there every time they make a change and make another pen test. Or maybe you can and make a lot of money, but that's probably not the safe way to go. Um, moving on, there is another tool that I contributed to that is pronounced testicle. And yeah, I didn't come up with the word, though. Uh, so TestTCL is a tool that's uh, used for unit testing. And it's running in a Java environment that has a TCL interpreter. And that environment. Uh, can uh, look at logical flaws that you can make to your code so that you can actually put it in a, a test or a unit test and you can actually try it over and over again with various types of inputs on your PC and not in the real environment, which is much more convenient. So you can quickly find out if you're vulnerable, you can quickly found out, find out if your logic is flawed, which is like half the cases, the logic is flawed in some way or another. And if you have more complex cases, that really, really will help you to divide the code into tiny modules and unit test those. Um, I contributed some code related to cookie handling. Right now, this, this tool is not entirely complete, but anyone is welcome to help. It's, mostly written in Tickle itself, and it's very easy to do. If you can code an iRule, you can definitely help out with this project. Uh, I wrote that I would make a demo. I'm, I, I don't have a demo of this. Um, but I encourage you to download it and, uh, and try it out. Um, and uh, there are and there will be released more test tools. Uh, during the summer for identifying these type of vulnerabilities. But due to responsible disclosure, I cannot do that yet. I really, really want you guys who happen to have these devices, and I'm sure that every other person in this audience belongs to an organization that has one, go back, take a look at this, investigate if you're vulnerable, and then I'll release the tools to you so you can actually start finding other devices or go to your bug bounty and make money or whatever. That's going to be the next step. I think this is it for me, and I really, really encourage you to ask questions because everyone's silent, and I'm sure there is a lot of questions out there. Hey, got to find a yeah. microphone for you guys. Hold on. I, I have a mic. You're so fast. I, I'm speaking fast. I'm finishing fast. This guy. That's what That's said. It. 
is that? Yeah, you said it. So, show of hands. He's over there. He's over there? Here somewhere? No, the, the hairy guy. This, this guy. The unorderly guy. The stuck guy. Thank you. Hey. Um, hey. I'm curious about the first part when you talked about how you're able to... It was forms, right? Or I'm thinking about, is it possible to get a full SSRF in it? When you're connecting externally, sending in some information, you're getting internal network information out. Yeah. So it's a full-on server-side request forgery. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you can, you can access something called iFiles if you want to do request forgeries for local files. You can do that. But you can also, yeah, you can also scan the internal network. You can turn this into SOX proxy if you want to. You can do port scanning with it if you want to. Bounty, please. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Anyone else? Sure, there must be more questions. Good. Go, sir. Hey. Um, <laughs> so just to, to double check, this, this is something you can't fix this by patching your F5 device, right? You have to fix your own code, that you, your own tickle code. Yeah, right? it's a good reminder. If I didn't say that, yeah, so the, f from F5 side, what they can do for you is that they can use their editor and they can warn you if you're doing bad things. But it's very, very hard for them to determine when you're doing bad things because today a lot of code uses eval and that necessarily doesn't have to be bad. It's only bad if there's user input in it. Uh, this is not a fixable issue. This is how the language works. You cannot take away, uh, I can't even go back there, but you can't take away two of the three ways of doing, uh, doing uh, um, quotations. Like you can't, you can't take those away today because then you would destroy every single script. You cannot remove expressions. If you remove math from programming, what, what's there left, you know? <laughs> um, and replacing the products obviously would take time. So what you have to do is go back and look at your own code, run these tools, and verify if your code is safe or not. That's what you can do. There's a guy down there with his hand up. Yeah, show of hands. Oh, I see you. I'm so happy oh. I took the time for your questions, because like, since I rushed through it, there's going to be a lot of asks, obviously. Thanks for a great talk. Some uh, interesting things with the big iron. Uh, I would just like to add that uh, these devices usually also uh, provide uh, stickiness cookies. So even though you don't find this uh, server header when you're scanning, if you get a cookie that starts with like big IP or something in a long fuzzy value, then uh, you could probably assure that it's a device as well. So something to include in the scanning, I guess. It's, it's true. Uh, and I, I don't know by heart the name of that cookie field, and maybe it can vary, but there is a, a cookie field that's generated to handle the, the case when you have more than one uh, load balancer, and, and those are communicating with each other using a cookie that they put on the client. That's true, and that's something you can put in your showdown tool thing. Anyone else? More questions? There we have There's one. two more. Yeah. See, can you pass the mic down? Thanks. Um, so when you did the showdown like scanning uh, to see how many F5s there were, did you do any like tests to see how many of these were easily available? Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been asked to do this by a lot of people, and I really, really refrained from doing it. Um, because eventually that's something that might turn out uh, in a case where I don't want to be, you know? Like, if I was in a bug bounty program, sure, I could do this on, on all the clients, obviously, and I think that's a good thing to do, but uh, this is an intrusion. Like, if you exploit and run code on someone else's system, it's an intrusion, and I really can't do that. And if I could do it, I wouldn't talk about it on stage. No, but <laughs> <laughs> really didn't do it. It wasn't me, okay. Raise of hands, more questions, yeah? Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, will these slides be available anywhere? They will. Yeah, if he lets sure. us, then they will be posted yeah, yeah, on sure. the YouTube channel. You can watch them over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. If sure. Peter doesn't mess up, but I don't think he will. 
Yeah. Yeah, uh, I won't have the videos in the slides, but uh, then you have to go back and watch the the video. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Don't be shy. He bites. No. Okay. Well, thank you, Christopher. Thanks, guys. Awesome. With time to spare.